The first panelist is Robert Brugman. Um, Rob, Bob is a professor emeritus of art history, architecture, and urban planning at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, Bob is among the, most, the city's most distinguished architectural historians, with books and writings that range from monographs in Halliburton Roche and Harry Weiss to his groundbreaking book, Sprawl, A Compact History, published in 2005. Please welcome Bob. Uh, thank you, Allison. I thought what I'd do today is to give a little background, a little um, historical context for neighborhoods. Now, I think that this is the contrast that most of us think of when we think of Chicago neighborhoods. Um, the lakefront, the tall buildings in the city, and then um, out in the suburbs, the 1950s suburbs of Hoffman Estates. Um, but I think that over the last couple decades, there have been enormous changes, and these, this polarity has um, been very much uh, modified, and I want to talk about some of these changes. But first, a little history. Now, for most of its history, Chicago, like most large cities, has grown in two ways, either incrementally around the edges, like the rings of an onion, or has jumped. Uh, along the transit lines, along the railroad lines, and then along the, um, the superhighways. And I think you can see that very clearly. You can also see the enormous explosive growth outward, particularly since the 1920s. But this hasn't been just scattershot. It's been very well organized, self-organized, actually. And so various ethnic, religious groups, um, racial groups have tended to move outward along those transit lines, which allows them to move outward to new housing, but then to come back in to places like synagogues and churches, um, bakeries and other institutions that move slower than the families themselves. So if we look at some of these moves out of the city, let's take the Irish, for example. Um, the Irish, like most immigrant groups in the 19th century and early 20th century, landed very close in to Chicago in these rough industrial districts that were right around the loop. So for example, a lot of the Irish would settle in a place like Bridgeport. Uh, this is one of the city's oldest neighborhoods and this was the place where if you were a successful working class family, you might aspire to buy a house like this, the worker's ranch, a very typical worker's ranch here. Um, however, as you became more affluent, and let's say your children actually became um, moved into the solid middle class, um, they might move further to the southwest along Archer Avenue, along the um, river and the canal that you've been hearing so much about, and you would move into a new house, um, and in this case it might look like this, a typical one of our famous Chicago bungalows of the 1920s in a place like Gage Park. Now the interesting thing here is that this building type is really exactly the same as the, the workers' um, cottage, and we'll see in the next uh, manifestation of this type that this starter house remains pretty much the same. What changes is the equipment in it. And so as the um, working class of Chicago becomes more affluent overall, we see this um, gradual improvement of the housing types. So by the 1950s, this family might be moving all the way out of the city into the suburbs, the near southwest suburbs of Evergreen Park. Uh, by now, there's a big picture window in front. Um, there's a big TV right behind that, and a kitchen that's fully equipped with all the latest post-war conveniences. And nearby, um, the big um, suburban shopping center, actually still in the city at this place, of, at this point of Evergreen Plaza. And the same is going to be true of the Polish up on the northwest side, up along the, what's now the Kennedy Expressway. Um, there are some minor variations. For example, with the Jewish population, um, they moved here and a great many of them were initially immediately west of the loop. Some of them moved south, down to places like Hyde Park, to the west, to places like Lawndale. But then they, and this is very unusual, jumped in direction, and a great many of these congregations moved north, up to Rogers Park, in the north of Chicago, and up to the um, North Shore suburbs. We see a similar pattern with the African Americans. Um, you see that dark black mass there, that's along, essentially along State Street. Um, as the African American population expanded, 
and it did this in a very slow and painful way because of all kinds of legal and informal restrictions on where they could live. Um, as they pushed further south, the area to the north um, became uh, more and more um, dilapidated and became a slum known as the Federal Street Slum. And particularly after desegregation dismantled many of these practices that discriminated, the middle class of the African American population could move to places like that on the um, upper left side, that's Chatham in the south suburb, a uh, south neighborhood of Chicago, and the northern part of the area um, looked like what you see on the right there and um, was considered to be uh, blighted. Now, watching this long process of decentralization, sociologists at the University of Chicago, the so called Chicago School, uh, people like Robert Park and Ernest Burgess, developed their model of cities based directly on what they saw in Chicago. So on the right-hand side there, you're looking at their sketch where they looked at actual conditions in Chicago and then the generalized model on the left. In this model, what invariably happened was that as people became more affluent and moved out, it meant that there was going to be degradation and deterioration in the neighborhoods closer in. Now, this model was tweaked over the years but it held sway really essentially for well over 50 years. Uh, here's the way Homer Hoyt, uh, another Chicagoan, an economist this time, saw it in the 1930s. And by the way, I should say that Chicago became the classic location for this urban sociology. This was really the place in America where these kinds of trends were most closely watched. So what Hoyt did was he said there were sectors and that the movement out was differential. It, it went, for example, in different directions for different parts of the population and at different speeds. But he still had the same basic idea, and you see his summary here on the, on the right-hand side, that you have around the loop a very um, uh, low-grade residential area followed by a medium grade, and then only at the periphery of the city in the black do you have um, high-grade residential. And at least through the 1950s, this model seemed to predict with some accuracy what was happening on the ground. So by the 1950s, uh, most observers felt that the entire area around the loop was blighted, was dilapidated, and needed to be completely removed and rebuilt because the business interests of the central loop felt that they were being strangled. And so this, in turn, led to a massive program of clearance for new highways, new middle-class housing, and public housing. So you're looking here at um, Carl Sandburg Village on the north side, um, which was a, uh, a market project, not a public housing project, but the building stock is actually remarkably similar. But in fact, even when Park and Burgess were writing in the 1920s, things were already changing. Um, the rate of decentralization, which was speeding up in the 1920s, hit its peak in the 1950s. The 1950s saw the largest average lot sizes in the history of Chicago, in fact, probably in the history of the world and uh, of large cities in the world, because they hit one quarter acre, or 10,000 square feet. But already by the 1920s, the wealthiest families were no longer moving out to the periphery as they had been it was now more middle class and working class families. A lot of the most wealthy families were staying where they had been um, since the turn of the century. So over the years, since the 1950s, even as house sizes have gotten larger and larger, lot sizes have been declining. So the average density has been starting to go up in the outer suburbs. There was also, in the 1920s, when Park and Burgess were writing, ample evidence that some inner neighborhoods weren't going down in socioeconomic status. They were, in fact, going up, a, a kind of thing that we call gentrification. And, and here I'm using gentrification not in any polemical way, but simply as a neutral term, meaning a rise in socioeconomic status. Um, Park and Burgess certainly knew about the Bohemians that lived in Tower Town, the area immediately west of um, Michigan Avenue. Um, here are some manifestations of it, um, a famous Bohemian club, 
and these um, renovations that the artist Edgar Miller and um, Saul Kogan did on Burton Street. Um, I think that uh, they knew these, that is, Park and Burgess knew these places, but they didn't think they were important. They were little blips. However, by the 1940s, it was already apparent that there was, in fact, much larger gentrification, and a lot of that gentrification was taking place in Old Town, just to the north of Tower Town. And um, this art fair, uh, which became a big institution in Old Town, was a very good indication of that. Now, in the years since the 50s, this gentrification has spread dramatically on all sides of the loop, um, up to three to five miles, in fact, in all directions from the loop. You can find at least pockets of gentrification, some of it absolutely um, breathtaking in its scope. So um, here's a place that I lived just west of Old Town for a number of years, uh, ordinary working class neighborhood, so ordinary it didn't even have a name, um, and I watched this astonishing thing happen around me. So here's what I saw just down the street. Uh, these two houses very much battered and, and remade over the years. And this is what replaced it. So along this street, a very modest working class housing was going up the largest single family houses being built in the city. Uh, probably here, because if it were in the historic district, this would have been prohibited. Now, Aaron, um, Alan Ehrenholt has called this massive gentrification at the core and increasing diversity and poverty in the suburbs the great inversion. Now, he probably makes too big a case of this, but something very dramatic is happening as affluent people are moving into the city and a more diverse and less affluent people are settling in the suburbs. Today, more people living in poverty are living in neighborhoods in the suburbs than in the cities. And you can see the shift here um, of income groups. You can see some um, very wealthy people living along the, in the center there, along the north, uh, along the lakefront, but then all to the south and down around into uh, northwest Indiana, you see um, extreme poverty, and a lot of that poverty is out in the suburbs, particularly the south suburbs. This has had a profound um, impact on the demography of the Chicago metropolitan area generally. Um, there's much greater diversity out in the suburbs these days, and there's arguably less diversity in the city, particularly in some of the gentrified neighborhoods. So if you um, drive around, you find these um, rather remarkable things. For example, this um, temple um, out in the far western suburb of Aurora, which is there because the new immigrants are not coming into the area immediately adjacent to the loop anymore. They can't afford it um, as it's become gentrified. And so many of them are moving to the suburbs, even to the far outer suburbs. And this has also meant that there's been a great deal of change within central neighborhoods. Um, here, for example, in Pilsen, in the near southwest side, um, a predominantly originally bohemian neighborhood um, that is from central Europe, um, then um, and now primarily Mexican-American, um, but as the, as because it's so close in and the, the, um, it's so close in and the transit is good enough, um, there have been a great many newcomers pushing up the pricing of, prices of housing and also new construction, uh, and often new construction that seems to be um, very much out of scale with the small buildings that were um, there. This, this um, idea of teardowns has been um, roaring across the Chicago area, at least um, except for 2008 to 2012, it seems to be starting again. Um, a lot of it is in affluent suburbs like Hinsdale, but it's surprising that you can even see this in some well-located um, working class suburbs. So here's one of the most surprising. Um, you see Burbank as you're coming in from the south to Midway Airport, and you can see on the left side there those modest houses that were built in the 1950s, and then this remarkable transformation as they're bought up and these um, very large new houses are being built, and not for a very different population, typically for the sons and daughters of some of the people that lived in the original houses that moved out further in the suburbs, became affluent, and now want to move back in. As the suburbs become denser, we're starting to see large apartment buildings, we're seeing many more row houses. As I say, the lot sizes have been going down rather 
fast, actually, in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, we're seeing more row houses than we've seen at any time since the Great Fire in the Chicago area. We're even seeing conversion of factory buildings, um, like this conversion of a Kroller um, furniture factory in far suburban, far west suburban Naperville. Now, all of this change has been happening at what appears to many residents of city and suburbs as a bewildering place. Now, here's a kind of um, indicative marker of this. By the time the city got around to making, marking Boys Town, an area in Lakeview um, on the uh, on the north along the lake in the, in the city, uh, north of the loop, there had, been a, um, had, there had been a high percentage of gay men a couple of decades ago, but by the time this pylon went in, um, a great percentage of them had already moved much further to the north, and so it was mostly the bars that were left. But the very idea that the city would officially mark a part of the town for any group, um, racial, ethnic, uh, or uh, bisexual orientation was, of course, extremely controversial in a city where the whole idea of the city is that it's constantly changing and these neighborhoods are constantly changing in their makeup. So um, these are issues that have no easy answers. Uh, all I can say that's indisputable is that Chicago, like all great cities, has an astonishing variety of neighborhoods of all kinds, and they are always in constant flux. Thank you.